Hey, and welcome to FutureThinkers.org, a podcast about the evolution of technology, society, and consciousness. I'm Mike Gilliland. And I'm Yuvia Ivanova. If you're new to the show and you want to get a list of our favorite books, popular episodes, and to join our community, go to FutureThinkers.org slash start. Hey guys, today we're doing the third feminine archetype in our series on Jungian archetypes. This one is going to be the lover. So if you want to check out the previous ones that we've done, we've done all the males already. Uh, we have one more left after this, which is the... The witch. The witch. Right. So, and you can check out like all the links and show notes and everything in the description of this video. So we're doing the lover. Why don't you tell me about the lover? Sure. So the lover archetype is uh, an archetype of love, beauty, and creativity. So um, she is the embodiment of the energy of Eros, which is the, the Greek word that eroticism comes from. So it's basically it's sexual energy. And so um, post-agricultural societies, including our modern society, haven't fully reconciled feminine sexual energy. So this archetype is probably the most repressed and the most difficult to talk about. So um, Tony Wolf, who was the uh, mistress and collaborator of Carl Jung, wrote, um, you know, wrote about the, the four key feminine archetypes, and she called this one the Hetaira. But it's funny because Hetaira, they were a class of women in ancient Greece who, were, uh, who didn't bear children and they weren't wives, but they were allowed to own property and they were allowed to, you know, host parties and entertain men at, at their property. And so they were kind of uh, high class courtesans, you could say, like uh, independent geishas or something. Um, but it's funny because their, their role was so confined to this very specific expression and the, you know, the other women in Greek society weren't allowed to express their sexuality. So it's, it's almost like, oh, well, if you want to express your sexuality, then this is your role and you're, you're sticking to it. You're basically just a court courtesan for life. And so that just, it demonstrates um, how, you know, societies have a problem with female sexuality and that if a woman expresses it, they kind of tend to put her in a specific category. And this is definitely less in modern society. We're kind of starting to reconcile that, yes, women have sexual desire and it's not pathological that they do it. Um, but we're still kind of struggling with it. And so I think that's reflected in a lot of modern movies that show this archetype. And it's always a little bit, there's always kind of something a bit off about it. So we see the femme fatale version of it, where the woman is kind of a seductress and she's, you know, leading a man into peril or she's using her sexuality to manipulate. Um, or on the other side, she's kind of clueless where she has sex sexual energy, but she's kind of unconscious about it. Um, so, and we see this, you know, with uh, Marilyn Monroe's characters, uh, for example, in Some Like It Hot, where she's very central, but she's just completely clueless about how that affects other people. Or uh, we see characters like Lolita, which again are clueless about their sexuality and end up being prey for men. I find this one to be quite interesting in the context of, um, well, the author, the original author of these female archetypes, because the position of this woman who is the mistress of Carl Jung, um, it seems that she kind of wrote her own position into the archetypes with a, a fair amount more gravity than she did, than she may have if she wasn't his mistress. Yeah. Like the lover archetype or the Hetaira, actually, they kind of, I think that's the one she originated, right? And then other people kind of said, eh, maybe let's call it lover. Um, it's a very filled out archetype but it seems to have, yeah, her, kind of her personality written all over it. So what were your thoughts on that when we were doing the research for this? I know it was quite a bit harder to do the research on the feminine archetypes than it was for the, the masculine ones. Yeah, so we mentioned this before that there's um, the literature on the feminine archetypes isn't as consistent as with the masculine types. And so on one hand, we have... Uh, Tony Wolf and then also Carl Jung's wife, which wrote a bit about the feminine archetypes. So that's the old early 20th century um, writing. And they brought their biases of the time with them. So the, the archetypes are kind of very much confined to specific roles and they're not in their fullest expression. And then um, during the uh, 70s, 80s and 90s, uh, the 
kind of neo-pagan and new age movements picked up the arch feminine archetypes and started writing about them more. But a lot of it is written in very kind of, you could say, hippie language. Um, a lot of uh, kind of ethereal language that isn't down to earth and kind of difficult to understand if you haven't read that type of literature. And they use a lot of kind of goddess lore and mythology baked into it, which, which is a good thing. But again, it turns some people off who aren't very knowledgeable about it. And so uh, <laughs> they might say, oh, whatever, this is just hippie bullshit, it doesn't apply to me. But it's actually very much applicable and it's very, very useful if women get to know the archetypes and it's an excellent tool for self-knowledge and self-development. So that's partially why we're doing these episodes um, because we want to shed light on these subjects and there isn't a whole lot done on the feminine archetypes. So you mentioned the lover was not very well filled out in kind of Western media and television and, and movies and that sort of thing. And um, I was curious before we started doing this, what would be the benefit to someone um, manifesting this archetype? Uh, what, what are the differences between this archetype in its fullest and what is typically portrayed in media? Right. So why don't we talk about the archetype in its fullest first? So the lover in her fullest... Well, she wants to live life fully. She wants to experience everything deeply and intensely, passionately, and with with giving it her all. It's it's very pure, like it's not pathological. So this archetype usually develops in young girls as they're starting to go through puberty and become in touch with their sexual energy. There are kind of early childhood versions of it where um, and it's expressed as, you know, girls being interested in, in relationships and friendships and how they relate to other people. So that's the childhood version. But then as they start to um, go into puberty, they start coming in touch with their sexual energy. And they, it adds this huge dimension to their experience of relationships with people. And so the lover in her fullest wants to connect to people deeply and to have intimacy and, and companionship um, and she wants to explore so it's very playful it's very how would I say it she she hasn't become jaded by the social norms yet by by repression by you know other people's ideas about what a young woman's sexuality should be like or maybe she has but there's still a lot is she's still in the exploration phase and um so inter interestingly enough, the sexual energy is also the same as the creative energy. So creative energy is just a symbolic expression of sexual energy. So, you know, if a girl is interested in arts and, and music and dance and yoga and these kinds of things, it's also, it all comes from the same place. So this woman can often be uh, an artist or a muse for people. And actually in ancient Greece, um, there was also a class of women who were muses, who were uh, singers, dancers, musicians, who, whose job was basically to kind of inspire and entertain people. So the lover and the Amazon are quite intertwined with each other because the lover would imply some degree of vulnerability to be able to be fully expressed. But then there needs to be boundaries set up, which the Amazon archetype in its fullest would, would set up. Yeah, so that's, um, we can talk about that a little bit later of the shadow versions of the lover or what kind of trouble she can get herself into if she doesn't, she, if she isn't mindful. Um, but before we get into that, let's, let's dive a little deeper into the full expression of the lover. Sure. So the energy of the lover is very expansive and she doesn't have very strong boundaries, doesn't really care about boundaries. She just wants more expression, more feeling, more joy, more sensuality, more beauty. And it can get out of hand and it can get out of hand in a couple of different ways. So first of all, she might uh, end up falling prey to people who want to use her for that and who don't have the best intentions or who are just not, not careful, don't care about her feelings. Um, or she can end up hurting other people's feelings where she's, you know, very demanding and, and kind of encroaching on other people's boundaries and doesn't understand how she might be hurting their feelings. And so the Amazon energy comes very handy here because the Amazon is very disciplined, diligent, likes boundaries, likes rules. And um, so the Amazon can come to the rescue. 
uh, and we're talking about the same person here. So we're talking about the Amazon energy within the same woman that yeah. can can come in and lay down the law. You know, for example, if um, if a man is being overly aggressive and coming on to the woman in question, then she can, you know, call forth the Amazon energy that will be like, no, stop it. I'm not interested. Go away. Hard, hard nose. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about the childhood archetype version. So what does the lover in her childhood positive manifestation look like? So we talked about the childhood manifestation a little bit already. So it's all about uh, learning how to have relationships with people. Um, and so, you know, she's learning empathy, sympathy. She's learning to understand feelings, both her own feelings and other people's feelings, how they react to something she says or something she does. She's learning about boundaries and um yeah just understanding how how to have relationships with people and then when this manifests as the the active shadow version in the childhood archetype it can be manifests as quite clingy right yeah she can be very clingy so for example uh you could call it you know mommy's girl or daddy's girl usually daddy because this is um at this age the girl is learning that well there's a difference in genders and she's maybe starting to have crushes on boys and you know um dad is kind of this um uh, in her mind is this perfect man so she might become very clingy to daddy's energy and want you know his strength and protection and kind of um feel weak without without it jealousy is also part of this right mm -hmm. yeah yeah she can be jealous <laughs> sometimes we we see this in children for example when uh you know mom and dad are being affectionate with each other the little girl can start crying and be like no yeah, pay attention to me yeah so so in the um in the passive shadow it's when she becomes withdrawn mm -hmm. and that basically happens when she gets told no if she's trying to express herself or she's being too loud or anything like that then you know the parents say shush 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 children should be seen not heard and then that kind of withdrawn from both self-expression and love starts to happen exactly and so in some families people are not very affectionate and they actually ban affection um so you know they don't want their children kind of being touchy and that's actually really unhealthy because humans need touch we need touch and we need to learn what kind of touch is is good or not good or you know if it's too sexual or if it's just affectionate like we need to learn about all these things early on because if we don't then we could be opening ourselves to all kinds of trouble later first of all we you know this little girl can become very sexually repressed um if she doesn't learn about this at an early age or you know sometimes little girls are told not to touch themselves not to masturbate not to laugh not to you know draw with crayons on the wall not to express themselves in any way and that can be extremely damaging later on. And so what this can come out as later is um, on one side, they would be completely repressed. And on the other side, the sexual energy is still there. It'll just come out in ugly ways or unexpected ways or just like outbursts of, you know, anger or promiscuity. So either way, it's not healthy. So on this on this side, I'm <laughs> I feel very strongly about teaching little girls about healthy expressions of sexual energy instead of no expressions of sexual energy mm -hmm. yeah. yeah okay so let's talk about the adult shadows so the first one's the seductress sure and so this kind of character we see a lot in movies um you know femme fatale a variety of femme fatale characters um scarlett o'hara uh, marilyn monroe um, Xena on the top from James Bond. There are many of them. Um, Megan Fox often plays these kinds of characters or Scarlett Johansson. And so this is where a woman is brimming with sexual energy um, and she uses it to manipulate men or she uh, seduces them and leads them into trouble or, you know, hurts them or uses them to climb to the top or something like that. Or just she has no intention for any kind of commitment or relationship. She just eats them up and spits them out. Yeah. And on the other side, we have the frigid woman. Mm -hmm. And so this is a continuity um, sometimes of childhood repression, or uh, it could also be a result of sexual abuse. 
So because the lover energy is so open and unconditional and unboundaried, um, sometimes people can take advantage of it. And so then what can end up happening is that the woman will shut down because she will feel that, okay, well, this is what got me into trouble. So now I'm just going to not express this at all. And so we see this a lot with women who have been sexually abused, who just become completely frigid and are unable to connect to their own sexual energy because it feels dirty or unsafe or dangerous or painful. And so part of a, a woman's initiation, a lover's initiation into adulthood is to accept that heartbreak and to accept that grief that comes with it doesn't have to be even sexual abuse. It could just be, you know, having your heart broken. Accepting that as part of adulthood, that this is what's going to happen, and it happens a lot, but it doesn't mean that you're not capable of loving. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to love, even if you know that there's a good chance that you'll get your heart broken again. And so part of this kind of initiation and this is, you know, this is, again, speaking to women getting initiated by nature. This is something that a woman just has to go through internally is to completely accept her own grief, not to blame anybody for it, not to try to repress it, but just to feel it in all of its fullness, as painful as it might be. This is an interesting one for both sides. I feel like women in many ways, at least the ones I've had experience with, have been maybe a little more able to deal with both rejection and heartbreak and loss and this kind of thing. And a lot of men I've met in the past have been quite a bit more timid about this thing. It's like they put so much energy into um, the what they get out of a relationship. And when that relationship ends, it's like a world collapsing event. And I don't know if that's something to do with kind of the singular focus of the male mind or at least that tendency um but i've i do think it plays a big role in men's lives like that kind of attachment what was the shadow of that it was the shadow lover for the men mm -hmm. yeah that over attachment yeah we see the same thing in women this is and in fact i would say it's incredibly common i've met so many women who have become sexually and emotionally shut down after a heartbreak or sexual trauma where they're not able to feel pleasure, they're not able to open up, they're not able to have intimacy. It's incredibly common. Hmm. Yeah, very, very sad. This can be partially healed by another relationship that is safe and healthy, but it can be difficult because sometimes when women have trauma around this, that they end up and men actually is the same. They end up attracting people who the just same perpetuate kind. the yeah. same thing. Yeah. So this kind of trauma or heartbreak has to be dealt internally. It has yeah. to be dealt with internally, yeah. I believe. Yeah, and it needs to be dealt with before you can actually find someone who's maybe going to create more of a safer place for you and be more accepting for you. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a difference. Like you said, you you recreate the same event with new lovers. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, until you can figure that out, you're going to either keep doing that or you're going to repel the other lover, like the, the more positive form. Yeah, exactly. So let's talk about, before we close this off, what are the ways that you can manifest the lover in her fullness? Yeah. So as with the masculine version, um, focusing fully on central experience, really, really being present with it, being mindful in it and fully accepting yourself. And I know that this is easier said than done, and it can take years, especially for somebody who is really repressed or damaged, to come into you know full acceptance of their own sexuality and sensual experience. But I do think it's a very worthy undertaking because it just makes life better. There's something else to be said about the relationship between the lover and the Amazon in, in sex and relationships about so for men, they like to have kind of, at least I'll speak for myself and people like me at least, they like to have boundaries and like to be like to be told where those boundaries are so that they don't cross them in the future. But they're always going to push and push and push until that boundary is met. And so you need, and 
you need to be able to communicate where the boundary is. And then on the same token, you need to be able to communicate what it is that you need. Um, and sex is a perfect example. Women who, who feel like the guy is not doing it for them and therefore they don't say anything and therefore nothing ever improves. And the guy's kind of like, well, I'd be open to, you know, to improving, but then there's no feedback ever. So that's a really important thing. Communication. Like, yeah, yeah. But you need that and you need the kind of Amazon energy, the, the willingness to hurt the other person's feelings to get to the right answer eventually. So there's like the lover needs, uh, to verbalize what it is that she needs, verbalize her own needs, but have that kind of force of will of the Amazon. Yeah, another uh, really good and healthy expression of the lover energy is through creativity. And I think that this is in many ways more safe than expressing sexual energy directly for women because it it's symbolic. And then it's a little bit detached from their own feelings. So whether it's music, um, anything to do with the body is great, like yoga or dance uh, or gymnastics. Maybe not so much gymnastics, more emotional physical expressions like yoga or dance. Um, singing, painting, uh, design, any kind of aesthetics. Um, I think it's a really good expression of the sexual energy. So I think I have a few more questions here about how men could interact with w the women, the lover in either of her forms, the, the full manifestation or any of the passive versions. So what is the way to not get in the way? What are some tips maybe for the, the male not to get in the way and not to screw anything up with the, the making the shadows worse? That's a really awesome question, actually. Well, um, what are the benefits, first of all, mm -hmm. to the to the partner of uh, the lover in her fullness? Well, the benefit is that. So first Be of way all, way better sex, way better sex. There you go. Way better sex, um, more intimacy. You know, the relationship will just be healthier overall. If you're looking for a long term relationship, it's probably going to last longer. Um, maybe speak about the muse too, mm -hmm. because there's, there is sort of a historical storytelling context to the muse and the warrior or the hero, like the, the thing that inspires the man to manifest his fullest archetypes, um, because there's either family or lover or the society back home that he's, he's driving to protect. Yeah, exactly. So many um, male artists, poets, warriors, kings, uh, magicians, basically male archetypes of all sorts, um, or the, the people who embody them have written about, you know, having a muse in their life. And this is a woman who is, in, you know, an embodiment of the lover archetype who inspires them to achieve great things and to be better. And um, this is because it also in invokes the Eros energy within them, but then how it expresses... What is the Eros? It's the sexual energy. Okay. But it there are many different ways that this energy can express. Like, it's basically the life force. It's like one of the strongest energies in the body. It's energizing, it's, it's driving you to do things. And so, yeah, many men have been inspired by uh, a muse to achieve something. So... If, if you have a woman um, who is a lover archetype or strong in the lover archetype in your life, um, if she can express herself to her fullest, she is also going to inspire you to be better and help you develop and, you know, help you come into your fullness. So it's, it's a mutual thing because the lover archetype is very much about relationship. She's not just a hedonist trying to, you know, have pleasure and, and fun and, you know... Um, She's not doing it for herself. It's very much about mutual enjoyment, at least in the fullest manifestation. In some of the shadow manifestations, she can become very selfish about it. For example, um, the Tinder generation, where people are just, you know, they have no idea about what it takes to actually have a healthy relationship, and they're just judging people based on their appearance. And yeah, we watched that video. There's this video uh, series that's been coming out lately about speed dating and they actually do like basically Tinder in real life. So they, you know, there'll be a lineup of men or a lineup of women. They swipe left and right as they come up to them. 
And it's really brutal to watch. And there was this one episode where this woman was extremely picky and and put it really out there and she was very shallow and she talked about what her preferences were in in terms of values as if they were values so she's like basically uh i want to be choked during sex i'm not in defeat you better like to dance you better be taller than me and you better not be my age or younger and it was just like boom she just thanos the entire group of people and then after that i think there wasn't a single match for her at the end, right? Mm -mm. Yeah. yeah. So what is that shadow manifestation? That's like... That's unrealistic expectations and um, putting your own kind of selfish, arbitrary needs above the needs of a relationship. Yeah. And then at the end, she's kind of talking herself up and trying to be inspirational to the viewers saying like, well, you shouldn't have to compromise on your values. And I'm at a place where I don't want to compromise these things. These are my values and I'm, you know, it's okay to be what you are. And it's like, all she talked about was getting choked and that the guy has to be tall. It was just stupid. <laughs> yeah. Very shallow. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or another version of this is Instagram models who are just posting half-naked pictures of themselves all the time, but then they can't have intimacy in their relationships. So they're, you know, pretending to be very intimate with the whole world on Instagram, but then they're miserable in their life. And, you know, they are maybe not having a whole lot of sex, not a whole lot of intimacy, or just they have broken relationships. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, again, it's not a, not a very good option. Doesn't make people very happy or fulfilled. Yeah. So the last question that I had was what um, what should men do to either support or get out of the way? Mm -hmm. Well, I think shame and trauma are some of the biggest killers of the lover archetype. So if if she feels ashamed of her sexuality, then it's going to make things worse just not very comfortable and well it's going to make your sex worse <laughs> actually you know it now i realize why i brought the dating one up it was the pat or it was the active shadow like in that sense don't feed it i think if you're a male and she's acting like that girl was don't feed it don't give her what she wants like she should be alone for that she should be like selected out and she should continue as she said that pattern of shitty guys that she's dating all the time until she learns that lesson so it's like I don't know, it's not that guys would do anything different, but you, you get what you create is mm. essentially what is happening with her. She's just creating the only scenario where the only scenario that is possible is that she keeps getting terrible guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if you can really teach somebody that lesson. They kind of just have to grow up and learn it on their own. Yeah. And unfortunately, sometimes it happens too late. Like, you know, she might find herself at 40 and still single and there's just no you know, good single men available, and then she's just going to be really lonely. Yeah. Um, and then on the other side of what I was saying about shame, like if a woman feels ashamed of herself, like maybe she was shamed for her body or for, you know, her sexuality when she was younger, um, be very gentle. Don't, don't ever shame her. Like allow her to to express how she wants to express maybe like ask her you know what what feels good for you or what are your fantasies you know what what makes you feel excited things like that yeah. and um make her feel safe that's very important yeah. yeah um as far as as far as dealing with trauma um that's a tricky one it's kind of work that a person uh has to do on their own or with a trained therapist it's very difficult to heal sexual trauma for somebody if you don't know what you're doing. Okay. All right, so that's probably it for this episode. And if you guys wanna get any of the mentions or show notes, you can find them in the description of this video. Or if you're listening on audio, then you can uh, go to the link that you'll hear in a moment. That's it. See you in the next one. Bye. Bye. This episode is brought to you by Qualia, a nootropic supplement that helps support mental performance and mood. To get 10% off, use the code FUTURE at checkout. And to learn more about neurohacking, visit futurethinkers.org slash neuro. Thanks for tuning in to Future Thinkers. For all the books, resources, and mentions from this episode, go to futurethinkers.org slash 79. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notified of new videos. You can also follow us on social media to stay connected. If you'd like to get a t-shirt like the new Make America Think Again, go to futurethinkers.org slash store. 
If you like what we do and you want to help us make more podcasts and videos, consider donating or becoming a patron at futurethinkers.org slash support. Also visit our sponsor Qualia and use the coupon code FUTURE to get 10% off your purchase.